This is a production of Cornell University. Uh, thank you everyone for joining me today. And uh, as the introduction alluded to, I'm going to talk about my experience while on the Dreer Award. And uh, what my main focus is in giving this talk is, is less to kind of walk you through my experience in a chronological order, but more to share with you some of the uh, experiences, some of the findings, and some of the things that I found to be most interesting. Uh, while experiencing the uh, biodiversity in South Africa. So I'm here in the horticulture department, and I spent a number of years working in horticulture. And as a horticulturalist, whenever you come up and you meet a plant, you have to ask it three questions. What is your name? Where are you from? And how did you get here? And this is a, a great picture of a ficus macrophylla here in South Africa. This is me for scale, standing down here. And these are the kind of questions that I tend to like to ask plants because it, they tend to reveal very interesting stories. And when I ask this question of some of the plants that I've experienced and seen throughout visiting gardens or other places around the world, uh, one place kind of kept coming up time and time again where you just would find very unusual and interesting flora and just something that was just kind of outside the realm of what we tend to, tend to typically find. So as a lot of people know here in the horticulture department, um, South African plants have had a large impact on the horticultural trade. And uh, you may or may not realize this. I'm going to go through some examples right here of, of a bunch of plants uh, that you may not realize come from South Africa. So the Xantendicia, the calla lily, is a very common uh, plant that is endemic to South Africa. Uh, it has been used and hybridized extensively for all sorts of uh, ornamental qualities. Pelargoniums, the flowering geraniums, a plant that is completely ubiquitous in uh, use for planting in potting beds or as a popular bedding plant, uh, is a genus of plants that is also comes from South Africa. Nifofia, the red hot poker, a very common ornamental plant that we tend to find in uh, Mediterranean climates and subtropical regions and is used extensively, also comes from South Africa. Sterlitzia, the bird of paradise, uh, and, and a very interesting genus of plants. There's, there's five species that uh, comprise the, the genera, uh, including some that grow as large as trees, but as we can see from these pictures here, also picked up and used very commonly uh, as a garden plant ornamentally. The Proteaceae um, is, is, a big, is a large family of plants. Uh, but, but one of the very special components of, of plants that we kind of see in South Africa, a lot of people, when they think about uh, the Western Cape, when they think about Feinbos, this is one of the images that comes to mind, this idea, this, this protea, this, this group of plants that is unique to that region. And I'll get into some of these details as we go through the talk. Uh, proteas are used in, as for fresh flowers They're in the flesh flower industry, but they also, when you dry the florets themselves, can actually store quite well. And that's what this picture is illustrating here on the right. Uh, are, protea heads that have been cut and are dried and, and are going to be shipped all over the world to use for cut flower displays. Succulent plant biodiversity. Uh, South Africa boasts having roughly 30% of the world's succulent plant biodiversity and this is, we find this particularly in the northwestern part of the country where we find all sorts of interesting things like high diversity of aloes or many of the plants in the Azoaceae family such as Haworthias or plants like conophytums, uh, which are also commonly used horticulturally. People are very interested in these plants um, for some of the interesting adaptations they develop, uh, but also because uh, they're, they're fun and they're interesting and there's something different. People like to put them in terrariums and other such uses, such as this. Moss miles are conophytums what used to be called lyphos or lithos? They're two different genera. Oh. Uh, and then the bulb biodiversity is another major, you know, we're, we're getting through a lot of plants here, and I hope to be exposing people to the kind of diversity that is out there. But here are just some, some great pictures of the bulb biodiversity. And even here in the horticulture department, we focus on, uh, some of our labs focus on growing plants such as the ornithogalum, or as well as the um, eucomus is another cut flower and also bedding plant uh, that has also gained worldwide appeal and use in the horticultural world. And almost through one of the very interesting things about, uh, about South Africa is, is known as some of the mass flowerings up in Namaqualand. Namaqualand roughly refers to a, a region that is the northwestern uh, part of South Africa. 
And they're known for having these uh, magnificent displays if they get good rains in the, in the wintertime when they get their precipitation. And, uh, and this is a, a phenomenon that's been, been noted for, I want to say, um, since the mid late or early 1900s. Um, and just to kind of point out what's going on here in particular, uh, this picture on the far right, this is a picture taken at one of the National Botanic Gardens uh, that's actually managed more of a natural area. And what you're looking at here is, as you can kind of see, is just the, the vast diversity of, of, of different bulbs that are, that are blooming and, and growing in this one set of land. This is a landscape that has been managed primarily only by weed removal and maybe having, having grazing that came in and um, causes a natural disturbance. And this is a, a highlight. It brings people to this kind of part of the country where most people wouldn't go for tourism otherwise. But you contrast this to um, the shots here. This is a farm that's also in the Namaqua land region, uh, but they annually plow to encourage these pioneering species like the Ursinias here uh, that, that cause this kind of mass carpet blooming effect. And as you can see from the picture, it just goes on and on. And so these, Im these images of the mass blooms have really captured people's imaginations. Uh, this is a picture of one of the first, uh, it was actually taken by, by Hans Hera, the first curator at Stellenbosch Botanic Garden. Uh, where I was spending my drew experience. And this was one of the first photo, uh, color photographs to make it, uh, it was a postcard actually, and to make it to Europe and kind of put this amazing biological display uh, kind of on the world stage. And you also find some of the, the weird and the wonderful. So uh, plants such as the Hidnora africana here, which is a um, parasitic plant that grows on euphorbia, uh, and it's a piper ales. Uh, so related to uh, Aristolochia or the Dutchman's pipe that some people may know, as well as wonderful plants like uh, Wellwichia mirabilis, which is in the Natelli's order. Um, a very fascinating plant. It's the only species in its whole family, and this grows in the northwest region up into Angola and Namibia uh, in, in kind of this fog belt. And just a, a very unusual plant. People have been wonder, uh, amazed by it. And interestingly uh, enough, Stellenbosch Botanic Garden was the first garden to ever uh, grow this plant from seed and get it up to uh, a point where it would cone and set seed once again. So through that kind of display of, of pictures that I just showed you, I hope to have revealed um, just some of the things that really make the biodiversity of South Africa so fascinating, so interesting, and something that's pretty unusual compared to what we may see when we walk out of our door. Uh, so I think the, the natural question that comes to mind is, is why is South Africa so uh, biologically diverse when it comes to, to its uh, vascular plant flora. And I'm, I'm showing you an image here of what's known as a, a flower show. It's a flower show in South Africa. And this is a, in large contrast to what we may experience if we went to a flower show, maybe like the Philadelphia flower show or a flower show in Europe. A lot of these kind of flower shows that we may be used to are kind of more contrived. They're, they're image, we, we'll go and we'll see a plant, but the plant may not be the main display of the focus. Um, or focus of the display. Uh, it may be more kind of um, ornamental or innate, or, or the scene they create around it is going to be something um, that they kind of focus on. In South Africa, um, there's a number of towns that host these flower shows. And at these flower shows, what farmers and local people in that community will go out just into their fields, just around the roadsides, just anywhere that's around, and, and they'll harvest these massive amounts of, of just plants are growing around. These weren't grown ornamentally just for these displays. This is just the natural kind of abundance that's around. And they bring them, and, and of course, putting it together is kind of contrived in this kind of context of having so, many, so much of the biodiversity or, or the plants themselves stuck together in one place. But I, I like to share this image just because it shows uh, both a different perspective of how South Africans interact with their flora, uh, but also just the sheer mag uh, magnitude of the, of the diversity that's there. And these are great experiences for getting people interested in horticulture and gardening, but they also have a large educational component uh, where they actually have sections where they label all these plants and you can go and you can kind of uh, actually learn what's around you as well. So to kind of put South Africa in context and put the flora there in context, I'm gonna start with, with North America, a place that we're all familiar with. Um, North America, excluding uh, Mexico, so north of Mexico, makes up roughly 15% of the Earth's surface. And on that 15% of the Earth's surface, we have about 6.25% of the world's uh, total vascular plant biodiversity, 20,000 species, roughly. Now we jump to South Africa, 
And what we're looking at here is less than 1% of the Earth's surface, so 0.8% and uh, 30,000 individual species, so roughly 10% of the world's total biodiversity. So a, hu you know, a huge amount of biodiversity in a relatively small space. And this distribution is not even across the whole country. Um, there are certain areas that have more uh, speciation than others. So to, give, to continue to give people a context, we're going to work from a large scale and, and focus in. Now there's multiple ways how people choose to describe the different plant communities that are around them. And on the biggest scale, the scale we typically look at is known as uh, floristic kingdoms. And floristic kingdoms describe relationships that are primarily between family and on the general level. And they focus on three main different areas. They focus on distribution of these families in genera, either being cosmopolitan, very widespread, being endemic, very narrow, only occurring in a very small amount of space, or having disjunctions, uh, large barriers between different types of families. Uh, redwoods are a good example of that. While in China, you may have the dawn redwood, uh, Metasequoia glyptostriboides, while in North America, you have uh, the coastal redwood, or the giant redwood would be an example of distinction. And what I want to point out in this picture, you know, we can see that the Holarctic Kingdom is the largest, the one that we're probably most familiar with here. But if we look down to the tip of Africa, we see that there's one little section here that stands out in, in pink here. And this is known as the, ca uh, the Cape Floristic Region. And the reason why I show this picture and kind of point this out is that even on this scale, even on the largest scale of the Earth, uh, what we're seeing is that the, there's something going on down there that makes uh, the flora there so unique in its relationships and families and genera that, that, it, that it highlights this one region. It's the only country in the world that houses its own floristic kingdom. Um, it's kind of a big way of, of, of looking at plants, so there's some subjectiveness to it, but it's a good, a good general context. So now taking it one step down, we step into the levels of biomes. And what biomes primarily describe are plants based on their structure. How do they overall look? And on ecological factors. So the main factors that people use to uh, describe floras based on biomes are going to be minimal uh, winter temperature, seasonality of rainfall, and then summer aridity, how dry it gets in a region. Um, and these are kind of, we'll, we'll go, we're going to go into some of these in just a moment, um, some of the kind of big landscapes that we may think of. In the northeastern part of the United States, for example, we think of our hardwood forests as being our predominant biome. If we went to the Midwest, we would think of what historically would be the Great Plains as being another biome. So big kind of character, you know, uh, the way the floras grow, the way they actually look is the major kind of uh, driver of this, or the, the way we describe it. Um, and I'm going to go through a couple here. So we're going to start off with the savanna biome. This is found in the north eastern part of the country, and these are areas that are, tend to be dominated by uh, a lot of grass and few trees. This is the area where you'll find uh, the beginning of the baobab trees that will continue some of the world's most widest trees that you find that will continue up into uh, subtropical and tropical Africa. And these are the landscapes that support uh, the large mammals and the, that, that uh, are major drivers of the ecology in this land, landscape here. Uh, the next kind of biome, we stepped into a very big one now, is the forest biome. The forest biome is a very interesting biome. It's, it's the smallest. I think it's less than a percent of the total biomes. And that map I showed you before, you didn't probably even notice it because it was so small. And this biome is very interesting because it is a biome that receives um, most of, the, most of the, the biomes are in South Africa are either dictated by summer rainfall or winter rainfall. And that is a major definer of uh, the kind of plants that tend to grow in these areas. In the forest biomes, they receive um, rainfall all year round. And that is because they are on uh, just along the south coast of, of South Africa. And what's interesting about this biome is it's very, very concentrated. And, and unfortunately, with the lights, it's, it's hard to make this out. And the picture, what's, what's interesting about this picture here is saying it's a very kind of com compressed uh, where these forests actually grow. So this is along the south coast as you're kind of going north here. And pretty much where this picture cuts off right here, you end up in fine boss biome. So it goes from kind of shrubby grasslands, and then you come in down here, and you're in this, this forested area. And you can actually see this contrast right here. This bit, little bit here is actually uh, fine boss, and then, and then forest um, immediately stops off these cliffs. So it's a, it's a relatively small biome, but a very interesting one. It's where we tend to find, uh, obviously, the big trees, things like the Podocarpus fulcatus or the yellow wood, which are some of their giant trees, 
photocarps are an interesting, some interesting lineages in themselves, having relations to flora in uh, Australia or, or New Zealand and some large disjunctions there. I put this other picture up of uh, Trichocladus crenatus. It's related to the witch hazel family, which we may know from uh, our local flora here, uh, and, and kind of one of the few that is, that is present both in, in our flora as well as South Africa's. Another major biome is the uh, Karoo biome, uh, and this is the kind of areas that support a lot of this really interesting succulent plant biodiversity. Uh, they tend to get winter rainfall and have uh, a lot of these interesting succulent characteristics, cam adaptation, uh, and do interesting things like, like grow. As you can see in this picture here, they're little conophytums that are just eking out an existence just between these rocks where they're not gonna be exposed to direct sun and have their root system dry out. Uh, we, we tend to find a lot of biodiversity here in, in aloes or this uh, near endemic family Azoaceae with things like the drosanthemums and the, and the conophytums as well. And last but not least on our, on our tour of biomes uh, is the fine boss biome. And I think the fine boss biome is what most people think about when, when they talk about South Africa. It's the kind of the concept that comes to mind. And what this biome uh, is kind of looks like is you have lots of restios, lots of grass-like plants that we can kind of see on the slide on the right. And then on the left, this is kind of a more typical, we see uh, proteas in the background, but it's, it's a shrubby landscape. It never gets a much above three meters in height. And uh, this is where we tend to find the highest amount of our biodiversity and our highest amount of endemism in our plants. Uh, just a few more images of, of what you may find. It supports a large, um, bulb flora as well. And just a few more pictures here for, for context. You can see in this middle picture here just the, the size of this, of this flower head of this uh, Protea cineroides. So I've kind of walked people now starting from a global scale. We step down to a more, a more localized scale by thinking about biomes. And then the, the finest scale, well, pretty much the finest scale that we're going to get into here is vegetation maps. And a vegetation map is a way of defining uh, your flora based based on more of the, the species level and more of the general level. And what I kind of want to point out just here in this picture is that um, you know, as we look at the, the northeastern part of the country, we're still seeing pretty large swatches of, uh, of different color, or swaths of different color, uh, sorry, of solid colors. But as we get down uh, to the western part, we just see it, it, it looks like someone took paint and just like smacked it all over the place. We're seeing a lot of, a lot of different um, interactions between all these different specific vegetation types. And so each of these patches is big enough to be able to define them broadly by relationships or, or likenesses between species in general. But even within that, we see that we have tons of, tons of um, different vegetation types going on. And just a quick thing to point out here, um, this is pretty much we're looking at the fine boss regions in this area, and this is more of the succulent crew. And these are the main areas. The Western Cape is really the main areas where we find this, these high levels of speciation uh, occurring within these, these families. So just another blow up of this area. We can see that uh, it's, it's on the coast. This is an area that primarily receives winter rainfall. And the, the mountain ranges here, going both north to south and east to west, are major definers of this kind of landscape. So the Western Cape, as I've probably hammered into everyone's head at this point is, is highly diverse. Um, but it's, it's not just highly diverse. It, one of the things that make it very unique is that you have this high level of endonism. And that's why when you look at um, the floristic kingdoms on a broad scale, this area really shows up. So one out of five families, 20% of the families in, in the Western Cape are endemic. And on a species level, up to 70% of species are endemic. And so what that means, again, is plants that are occurring in just one location, but even in most cases, a uh, short distance away, uh, you won't, you'll find maybe related species, but not the same ones. And so again, it comes back to the question of, of why is this actually happening? And uh, it's not an easy question to answer. Oh, sorry, I got ahead of myself here. Uh, sorry, the, so the other thing that defines the Western Cape region, other uh, flora there, other than the highest levels of of, of endonism is also uh, what one uh, botanist described as the effect of excessive speciation. Uh, and the, the most striking example of this is, is the genus Erica. 
Uh, it's known to grow in other parts of the world as well, but in South Africa, out of the 860 species that are known globally, 730 of those occur just within this one small area. And there's other uh, large examples of this, such as the geraniums, the pelargoniums, or gladiolus, or axalis, other plants that people in this room may be familiar with, having uh, species numbers that are high above 100, just found in the Western Cape. So again, the question is, why? Why is this, why is this happening, and what are some of the kind of major drivers that are, that are causing these, this kind of speciation to occur? And uh, there's three or four that I'm going to present right now. The first one, as I pointed out in the picture previously, was that these mountain ranges are a very uh, important part of the, of the landscape uh, in the Western Cape. And the, the main hypothesis or theory here is that these typo topographically complex regions uh, act as, ice, uh, as barriers causing isolation of plants within them. So you may have a plant that has distributed to a certain extent and then for, from changes in the landscape or just over time, there's not, gene flow is not able to move back uh, and you end up having speciation events that therefore uh, cause some of these patterns that we're seeing. A few more images of the topography of the Western Cape. The next is the edaphic, the, the soil properties of the region. And, and this has been described as, as kind of a mosaic, if you looked at a soil survey map of the Western Cape, where you have in, in very close proximity to each other, uh, very different soil types. And the main theory here goes is that you're gonna have sister species that are related um, to each other uh, but in different soils will have uh, speciated and, and formed new ones uh, as being the next kind of major driver. Uh, oh, and the thing I, I'm sorry to scale back, the, the other thing about the, um, the, the mountain ranges, the, the other major driver here that, that is important is that in these mountain regions, uh, it, it's considered to have a long period of climatic stability. And that is uh, you know, one thing you hear oftentimes cited in uh, in, in some of the botany literature is that these long regions tend to drive speciation as well. And then the, the last major, major dryer, driver is fire adaptation. This is actually an image that was taken just last Wednesday in the Western Cape region uh, in an area that's known as Silvermine. And this is uh, as it was kind of burning in, burning in full forest. This is uh, about a day later, looks like absolute moonscape. And uh, like I said, this just happened last week. And here is a picture of the same region when I was out there in, in December. Uh, so complete transformation. Uh, but, but most importantly, what the, this main kind of the theory that goes behind this are the, the plant's abilities and their adaptations to deal with fire. And the main two different adaptations that you tend to find are on one hand the re-sprouters, the ones who aren't, uh, root systems are not completely destroyed by these, by these events. Uh, but actually have the ability to sprout up once again, or the reseeders, the plants that actually need uh, fire to act as scarification, um, or also just remove competition to occur. And the, th the, uh, the idea here is that you tend to have sister species that have different fire adaptations. Uh, so based on one or the other, you have this speciation events occur. So based on kind of all these different things, I, I thought maybe South Africa might be an interesting place to go and have a look at plants and to study the flora and, and to help out a little bit. So I put in an application for the Dreer to work at Stellenbosch Botanical Gardens and uh, just experience this remarkable flora. And so to give people a background on Stellenbosch, uh, it is the oldest university botanic garden in Africa. It was originally established in 1902. Uh, primarily for as a teaching garden. Uh, about 20 years later, it moved to the, the location that it's at now. And early on, they had a big focus on uh, succulent plants. As I showed that picture of the postcard before by Hans Hera, he was the first curator and uh, did a lot of work with this uh, near endemic family, Azoaceae, as well as some of these other things like, like Wellwichia. Uh, and at Stellenbosch, the, the garden was originally based off the, uh, the garden design at Padova, uh, the world's oldest botanic garden in Italy, but over time it has, has changed. And uh, Stellenbosch is in a pretty interesting 
uh, position, and I'll kind of go on, I'll talk a little bit more about this in, when I talk about some of the uh, national botanic gardens. But one of the things that actually makes them stand out, and this may seem like a funny thing, since I just went on and on about how interesting the flora of South Africa is, is that, is that they actually grow exotic plants. They grow plants that aren't from South Africa. They do grow a lot of plants that are from South Africa, particularly for their conservation program. Uh, but what this actually does is it, it really creates an opportunity to engage the public and to draw them into the garden. Because uh, you know, for you know, someone like most people in the room or myself, you go to South Africa because you want to see the flora. You want to see the fine boss. You want to see these, uh, these families that are just totally you know, different than what we're used to. But when you grow up around that, you may not actually realize that what you have around you is so spectacular unless you, uh, you know, have opportunities to engage with it. So one of the unique places that Stellenbosch is actually at is that they can grow things like Victoria lilies, um, or strong load on the jade vine, or even do the uh, have bonsai collections, which which draw people in and engage them with the plants and the landscape in a different way than uh, some of the other gardens in South Africa can do. Uh, they support the educational mission of the university, and they do this through labs and practicals, uh, as well as uh, collaboration with researchers. Uh, the example down here is they, uh, Stellenbosch houses the living collection uh, for Oxalis. This is one of those uh, genera that I mentioned before has more than 100 species in it. And uh, they, they maintain the living collection so that the taxonomists who are working on it and the university um, can use it as part of their research. And there's a really good relationship for, for both of them. Uh, Stellenbosch being a botanic garden, they, they keep uh, they have a plant record system, and they use the Iris BG system. Uh, they're, they're, as of right now, some of the National Botanic Gardens have also gotten on board finally, but they're actually, Stellenbosch was the first garden to have a comprehensive plant record keeping system. And this is one of those things that, um, you know, most people kind of maybe not think about plant records all the time, but it's one of those things that makes uh, a botanic garden different than just a park. The fact that we, that every plant that comes into the collection is, is labeled, is numbered, we can keep up with the taxonomy, we can take images of it. If it's wild collected, uh, we'll take GPS points, and, and then therefore you know that when you bring that plant into your collection, it's not just something interesting to look at, but it also is a representative of that population from the wild. It brings a lot more value to your collections and also assists in things like when you're actively involved in um, plant conservation programs. They also run a, a uh, plant conservation program, as I was just kind of going on about. Uh, these are the three species that they focused on. Um, I'm not going to talk in too much detail about this, but this was one of the primary things that I worked on while I was down there. Uh, this is a, just have to point it out, this is a Drosser regia. It's, it's, it's a sundew. They grow around here as well, but there's a lot of diversity down there. And it's one of the biggest in the world. They're, they're carnivorous plants, um, and this is a hat for scale, uh, but you can just see the massive length of these leaves. And just a among carnivorous plant growers, this plant has, has gained a lot of attention because it is just so, so weird. And uh, last but not least, uh, Stellenbosch Botanic Garden is another one of its strengths and other things that makes it stand out is that it is not part of the national uh, botanic garden system. It's a small garden. There's only eight permanent staff. Its affiliation with the university uh, allows it to take on initiatives and to kind of be very nimble. Um, and they may not have as much capital or resources as some of the bigger gardens to focus on projects, uh, but their small size allows them to make kind of meaningful small impacts. And so my main goals, I'm just going to go over those while I was in the Drew experience, was to go work at Stellenbosch Botanic Garden, but it was to develop my, my field botany skills. And some, you know, I'm in the horticulture department, some person may ask, why should you develop why should you work on field botany, and particularly in botanic gardens, which I hope to continue in once I graduate here, and I've worked in in the past. Uh, this line between, between botany and horticulture is, is, is not, not so well defined. A lot of the plants that we come to appreciate in this day and age, either as ornamental plants, uh, obviously at some, place, at some point came from the wild, and uh, botanic gardens for a long time have had a very active role in plant exploration, and also bring plants into cultivation so then we can use them in various different types of ways. It was also to help out in this plant conservation program. Uh, it was also a reciprocal agreement. So in order to give some expertise and some training uh, to the garden itself, so I helped out in doing, I uh, did a lot of work on the on plant records, as well as getting in and doing horticultural work, uh, but also did training. Uh, I've got a background in arboriculture, so 
doing some work with some of the staff and learning how to tree climb, how to do proper chainsaw safety use, um, and a couple of these other kind of skill sets that they didn't necessarily have down there. And then last but not least was to gain experience in botanical gardens. And not just at Stellenbosch, but also with a number of the other botanic gardens that I interacted with while I was in South Africa, uh, learning about how they conduct horticulture in this, uh, with these special plants that they grow there, and also to learn about how they manage their gardens and what their general approach is, and just kind of learning about the, the management of how this is all done. And while I was down there, I also had an opportunity to have a look around. Pretty much all the pictures that we've seen so far are pictures that I've taken, with the exception of a few. Uh, so this is just an illustration. This is not all the places that I went, but this is just illustrations of some of the natural areas and botanic gardens kind of across the country that I had opportunities to visit and interact with. So for the last kind of part of my talk, I'm just going to talk about the state of biodiversity in South Africa, and as well as a little bit how plant conservation is actually conducted, since that was the main kind of focus of my work down there. And uh, the, the state of the biodiversity in, in South Africa, as, as I've kind of described before, is, is very fascinating, uh, but is also very challenged. Um, one of the challenges that we have in terms of figuring out how to do effective plant conservation work is that uh, the, we still just don't know, people still just don't know. With, with 30,000 species occurring across all of South Africa, people just don't even know what the full extent of the flora is. So the flora is far from complete. Uh, new species are found uh, all the time. Since 2009, there's been more than 300 new species described. And the, the rate of discovery cannot be kept up with the expertise of taxonomists, either in South Africa or, um, or, or abroad, since there's experts in these groups kind of all over the place. Uh, many of the threats to biodiversity, the, the three main biggest ones are ones that we are familiar with, the loss of habitat, uh, alien species, species invasion, as we can see uh, up here, just marching. These are the Western Cape region, just having uh, Port Jackson uh, march across an invasive tree, just march across the landscape, as well as a, a large one is unethical plant collecting. Uh, this isn't a picture from the field. This is actually a picture of Kirsten Bosch Botanic Garden, where people actually came in um, at night and somehow stole cycads directly out of their collection, which is a, an amazing feat, but really unfortunate. So I'm going to go over uh, some of the major players and the way that, the way that um, plant conservation is actually conducted in South Africa. And as I mentioned before, the National Botanic Gardens are, are a major player in this, and they fall under the, the purview of what's known as the South African uh, National Biodiversity Institute, or SANBI. And SANBI is a, is a large blanket organization. They are a government organization that primarily uh, covers all biological research that goes on across the country. So you could be, have entomologists, ornithologists, marine biologists, uh, botanists, and so on and so on that, that are under this. Um, since they are very large, it is, they, they have a lot of resources and can make large impacts, but as I was kind of describing before, they may not be the most nimble and be able to take quick action, which sometimes is necessary. Um, and SAMBI oversees the National Botanic Gardens uh, across all of South Africa. There are, there's ten, a tenth has just recently been added. Um, and the National Botanic Gardens are very interesting institutions. Uh, they have a strict mandate to only grow native plants. And this is kind of getting to the point of what makes Stellenbosch a little bit different. Uh, and, this is, and this is a wonderful mandate to have, because with so much biodiversity down there, it's important to have folks that are, that are really focusing on working on these groups that don't grow anywhere else. And also to learn how to display them and get the, the public generally engaged with them. So these are mostly pictures all taken at Kirstenbosch Botanic Garden. Uh, another interesting thing about the National Botanic Garden is that they all have contiguous natural areas that are attached to them. So as you can see from both these pictures here, there's formalized landscapes in the front. The picture on the right uh, is Table Mountain off into the background that continues off into Cape Town, or uh, Leopard's Kloof here on the, sorry, this, that's on the right-hand picture. The left hand is the Kirstenbosch. Uh, and, and these natural areas are managed. They, they, they go on and make sure uh, invasive plants aren't coming in. They do population counts of species in there. And it's just a contigu uh, continuous part of the garden and the garden experience. Uh, which is a very interesting. This is this is a model that actually Cornell Plantations uses as well. Uh, they may not be contiguous, but Plantations also manages lots of natural areas, and it, it seems like it, it makes sense, especially if you want to do plant conservation work. But it's actually something that's fairly unique. There's not a lot of gardens out there 
that do this kind of have this kind of dual role of uh, natural lands management as well as cultivated landscapes. The National Botanic Gardens uh, house the herbarium, and they have departments that are work that do the work mostly on the systematics and taxonomy of describe actually describing the flora of South Africa. And they also, like I mentioned, have developed horticultural expertise in figuring out how to actually grow a lot of these types of plants. And they, they, they put this out to the general public in a number of different ways. These are examples of books of how to grow a lot of these uh, specific uh, genera or families of plants that may be unknown to most people. And they've also had the ability to, to uh, prioritize learning the horticultural um, practices that are necessary to keep these things alive. So this is an example of the succulent collection at Crewe National Botanic Garden. Uh, and, and, and getting to talk to the horticulturalists and the people that actually work with these plants is very, very fascinating because the, the amount of nuance uh, that they've uh, developed in, in how to take care of a lot of these really interesting taxa is, uh, is, is quite extensive. And it's great that they, that they have it. They're putting books out. They're, they're creating uh, a medium by which they can express this to the rest of the world. But the National Botanic Gardens aren't the only players in town. Um, there also are other, other folks who get involved. So this is an example of a partnership with industry and a group that I was able to spend some time with, uh, the Cape Institute of Micropropagation. They primarily focus on uh, Disa orchids, a genus of orchids. These are a, a couple of pictures of Disa uniflora, uh, probably South Africa's most famous uh, orchid. Uh, but, but they're a private organization that also does conservation work. So what that means is uh, they go out to the field, they, they're involved, they, they will do plant surveys, they'll GPS where actually they find these plants, um, they'll pollinate, take capsules, bring them back, figure out how to get them into, into culture, grow them on, and then they'll do different things with them. Depending on what species they are, if there's an ornamental interest in them, they'll figure out ways to continue these, these plants in culture and then send them internationally abroad to, uh, to make some money for the organization. But then they also will go back out and do replant reintroductions. Uh, the Cape Institute of Micropropagation also worked with Stellenbosch and uh, on Disa Barbata, which is one of the, uh, has one of the smallest uh, populations of, of any Disa. And, and they're doing repopulations using these kind of methods and protocols. You also tend to find uh, conservation being conducted conducted in places like private gardens. Uh, in, in lots of, in the part of South Africa that I was in, there's lots of estates and, and vineyards that are kind of a major part of the horticultural trade in general. Uh, but one of the interesting partnerships that you'll, you'll find uh, is, is some of these gardens actually ac being active in plant conservation. And so the example of this is uh, the silver tree here on the right, Leucodendron argentia. Uh, was known to be kind of have one main population on Table Mountain that over the years has kind of declined. Uh, Kirsten Bosch has been active in, in maintaining that. But the only other known population, a disjunct population, was also found. And these aren't, these aren't the best pictures, but this is very close to uh, Stellenbosch, the town that I was in, these, these mountain ranges that are in the background. This, the Rustenburg Wine Estate goes pretty much right up to this mountain slope. And on these slopes, they found a, a second population of this Leucodendron ar argentium. And not because they have to, because they want to, and they're interested in conservation, they actually go out, they remove invasive plants, and they monitor these populations and uh, try to keep them uh, thriving as well. There's also a, a big citizen science initiative um, and, and people who are just generally interested in plant conservation in South Africa. And this is uh, one organized example of that, known as CRU, Custodians of the Rare and Endangered Wildflowers. And these are folks who are, uh, they're mostly retired, but they're a volunteer group that will, it's, it's based by region. They'll identify natural areas within their region that um, uh, haven't been surveyed, and they'll coordinate with SAMBI, and they'll go out and they'll actually do these surveys where they actually see what's going on out there, they'll keep population counts, uh, and, they'll, and then they'll submit that so that it can be used for, uh, for, for consensus across the whole country. Another example of this, um, is a program known as iSpot. iSpot is an application you can get for your phone. And uh, what it is, is if you are out botanizing, doesn't matter if you're just walking around, you're on your, your farm, you're on your land, and you see a plant that you don't know is of interest to you, you can take a picture of it, you can post it up on iSpot, either attempt to identify yourself or it will alert experts, and they'll come in and take a look at, at these plants and identify them. 
And this is a great way of kind of you know, doing quick surveying on the ground. But what's been interesting about it is that as more and more people have been um, using this program, that there's actually been a, a whole handful of species that have actually been discovered because of this process. Um, and this is an example of one that we saw. I saw one of the flower shows where uh, folks actually, someone just took a picture of this and went out to the expert. Uh, they, they didn't know what it is. They came and they did the field work. They, they were able to do, uh, describe it, find it, define it, and therefore it was introduced as a new species. So um, kind of getting towards the end of the talk here, wh why does it all matter? We, we've described how there's so much biodiversity in South Africa, and a lot of it is, is kind of under threat. And, and this is the same challenge that plant conservationists focus have everywhere. In um, South Africa in itself, about roughly 25% of the flora is either threatened or of conservation concern. Um, but the kind of point I want to make here is, is that you know we all know that plant conservation or any kind of conservation is a very important activity to undertake. And instead of focusing on what the sheer numbers are here, uh, through the, many of the examples that I've shared with you before, I think more of the point is that is that there's a lot of interested parties and, and interesting collaborations that are being conducted um, that really, really look to address these problems on multiple levels. Uh, and I think that was a really interesting and, and powerful finding for, for me to have. And uh, just, just in general, it's not just that in, on a global perspective that the plants that we all um, you know, are, are threatened or in peril, but, but there's also um, been a re restriction in, in in the uh, education of how to actually you know, conduct some of this work. So these are two articles that came out just this last week in popular media. Uh, one is talking about, uh, is talking about uh, collections specifically and the value that those hold. And the other one is talking about um, field biology skills and how fewer and fewer folks are actually being trained in these fields. So we have, issue, you know, we have challenges in conservation, not just on the plant side, but also in our education system. And I think my last kind of point is that, is that even though, again, we have these challenges, I think it's more of a, a point of optimism, that we still have places like educational institutions, universities, and botanic gardens which are able to pull all this information together. And since I've been giving this perspective from uh, the side of botanic gardens, uh, these institutions really stand out as being places um, that can do this work uh, not only on a theoretical level, but actually can get out there and do the applied work and they can bring all their resources they have to bear to, to this mission. So uh, not just monitoring these plants in the, in, in the wild and monitoring populations, but actually developing horticultural protocols, how to do in situ and ex situ conservation, how to document the flora of our world, and, and follow up with the kind of research that is, that is important to uh, allow plant conservation to happen. And so that's kind of it. So with that, I'd like to thank the horticulture section or department and the Dreer Committee for allowing me to have this kind of experience. Uh, there's a lot of directions this talk could have gone, and it went in a lot of different ways anyway. So if you have questions, <laughs> please, please feel free to come up and talk to me about it. I want to thank Stellenbosch Botanic Garden and the university, and in particular Martin Smith, the curator at Stellenbosch, and his wife Marinka Smith and their child Arya. And thanks for everyone who followed my blog and just showing up today. And with that... This has been a production of Cornell University, on the web at cornell.edu.